choosing a boat. Well, here's mine. I've had this boat 12 years and it took a year to choose her. So we must have got something right, mustn't we? Because we've still got her and we love her. She's doing everything we wanted her to do. The process of choosing her was fascinating because we started off with very clear objectives. We knew what we wanted. And that's actually the first thing you have to do. Define your objectives. Think to yourself, what do I want this boat to do for me? How many people do I need to take sailing? How much work am I prepared to do on a boat? All these questions have to be answered. And how far do I intend to go? Once you've got the answer to that, you can start to look at boats. And when you look at them, that's when your heart takes over. And when we looked at our boat, we thought, well, my goodness me, that's her. We knew straight away, we knew she'd sort of tick the boxes because we'd been looking at the broker's comments, we'd read the specification, we knew the sort of boat she was. But until we saw her, we couldn't be sure. And one time I bought a boat, uh, I was looking for a particular type of boat at that stage. This was donkeys years ago. And I hadn't found one. And we were in Scotland and I came over a hill and there was a boat anchored in the middle of a lock and I saw the boat and I happened to know she was for sale and as soon as I saw her I looked at Ros and Ros looked at me and we said that's her isn't it and we knew and we chose her with our hearts absolutely but uh, having had a good look at her our heads took over we did some sums we thought we can probably manage this and we kept her for 15 years so you see it is possible to make a decision with your heart, so long as your head doesn't run away. There's all sorts of boats out there, aren't there? There are modern boats, there are ancient boats, and there's every other type of boat in between. My own preference has always been for old boats, and that might suit you. If it does, you're one of a very small percentage, but it's, my family's always enjoyed old boats. And this is my daughter and her family. This is their boat, um, built in 1909. And they love this boat. It's great for the kids. It just does everything they want it to do. They have a lot of work to do on her. She didn't cost much to buy, but my goodness me, the workload's heavy. Even though they both have full-time jobs, they somehow manage it. That's the level of commitment. And if you're prepared to make that sort of commitment, there are big, big rewards for having a lovely old boat. But if you're not, you don't want to be working on the boat, you want to be sailing it, and maybe time is very limited, then you're going to have to buy a ready-made boat, like we did last time. If it's an old boat, you'll still have to do some work on it. You always do. But it's a brand new boat, with a bit of luck, there'll be nothing to do at all except climb on board, find a berth for it, and then go sailing. Going to a boat show is one way of finding out what's available in the way of boats, if you're buying a new one anyway. The trouble with that is, you very often, the boat might be afloat if you go to something like the Southampton Boat Show or the Annapolis Boat Show in America, and you won't see what's under the water at all. Or if you go to a boat show perhaps in London, the boat might be surrounded by stuff and you can't step back and get a real good look at her. So you don't actually know what you're buying. You know that she's got lovely accommodation and that's a very important part of what you're buying. You need to know the accommodation is going to work for you, but there's more to it than that. Um, for example, suppose the boat's got very, very high topside. Suppose she floats very high out of the water and a lot of modern yachts do. If you're going to have an alongside berth, that's going to be a problem for people getting off the boat. We actually disqualified a couple of boats when we were looking for our boat because Ros, my wife, said, I can't climb off that. It's too high. So, you know, these are the little details that you need to look at that can make your life happy. See the boat in the water, see her out of the water, and the last thing is, make sure you insist on having a trial sail. Don't buy a boat without having sail there. You might find that she's tender, leans over too much. You might find she's just plain slow, but you need to sail her and know that you like the feel of her and that you and she can love along well. So, what sort of boat should you buy? Well, define your objectives, think what you want, and then be educated about what different sorts of boats will do. 
This is a lifetime's learning really, but uh, I'm going to go now into the boatyard and we're going to have a look at three different boats. I've just seen them and it's absolutely brilliant the way they are. They're all set in one little place so I can basically stand in the middle and look at them. And each one of those boats tells us a story. And it may be that one of them is the right type of boat for you. So, let's go and take a look. Okay, I've popped into the yard now at Lymington down on the south coast of England and we're going to have a look at three archetypal boats. Here we've got a 1970s classic cruiser racer. These boats were originally designed to go fast and do a bit of cruising on the side. Well they've been around for oh, a long time now, 50 years, and they are great for cruising and you can still do club racing in them because they perform really well. But what I want you to look at is the profile of the boat. You see that fin keel it's all part of the boat. It's not just bolted onto the bottom. It's fared into the boat and you'll find that the ballast on this boat is inside the keel and it's probably moulded in. So that if you were to touch the bottom, it, you're not going to lose anything. It's all good and strong. The, the, the keel is part of the boat. It's not something extra. Have a look at the rudder. The rudder is supported by that piece of boat that comes down in front of it called a skeg. That rudder is really sound. It's rather a sexy shape, isn't it? I enjoy that. You can see the boat was made to go fast. But the sections of the boat are deep. The hull is quite deep when it goes into the keel. It runs down in this sort of shape. And that gives the boat essential seaworthiness. These boats, you can go anywhere with them. And you'll go reasonably fast. Not fast like a modern foiler or something like that, but quick enough. And in the event of storm conditions, they will look after you. I taught on a boat that was this shape for four years and we drove them upwind in conditions that really a lot of the other boats would have to go home in. These are magnificent boats but there's a drawback. Here it is. There's not much room inside. Compared with a modern boat of the same length, she's tiny inside. That may not bother you. If there's only two of you and you've got perhaps two young children, it'd be absolutely okay. But if you wanted to go off cruising with the rugby team or you've got two adult children plus you and goodness knows and the dog it's going to be a bit tight the money's good though not so expensive as a lot of modern boats so there you go compromise in all things and that's the first one i wanted to show you because actually deep down she's my favorite okay let's go and have a look at two more now okay here are my other two boats and look at them it's like the history of yacht development from World War II until the present day. On this side, we've got a long keel, heavy displacement, deep water cruiser. A fine boat that will get you there no matter what, and that will look after you long after you've lost interest in looking after the boat. Boats like that are fantastic for people who want to go a long way, or perhaps who have an eye to their heritage. The accommodation it's usually really charming in these boats. It's not big, obviously, you can see, but uh, actually it's all right. There's a lot of boat in the water there and the keel has got its ballast encapsulated. It's absolutely safe. The rudder is hung on the aft end of the keel, so it doesn't even need a skeg to support it. That rudder is not going to fall off the boat. It's a very, very safe boat. And I think it's quite beautiful, actually. I love boats this shape. I actually admire this. This is a Giles 38. And some years ago, I almost bought one at the time that I ended up buying the boat that I really do have that we've just been looking at. So, that's this one. What about this chap? Well, now, if you want to get there fast, here's your man. And there's a lot of them around now. They, of course, vary in how extreme they are. But the modern yacht very often has a very wide stern like this and that enables her to pick up on the water so long as you keep her on her feet nice and upright and she'll fly off downwind. And you'll notice that she's got two rudders. The reason for that is that her stern is, to be honest, unnaturally wide. Um, if she only had one rudder, and some years ago boats almost this wide did only have one rudder, when they heel over there's a lot of buoyancy in those quarters on the boat. That digs in, lifts the stern, the rudder half lifts out the water, and before you know where you are, the boats become unbalanced and, and you're out of control. Not nice at all. And such boats do have a tendency to do that, but if you've got two rudders, they probably won't. Two rudders leads its own issues. 
when you're maneuvering in harbour because you can't throw water against the rudder with your propeller like you can with a boat with the propeller in front of the rudder. You might think about that. But if it's got a bow thruster, you'll probably overcome that. They've got loads of room inside, masses of accommodation, because look at, look at all that beam. You can have cabins in both sides at the stern. You can have another cabin in the back. You get lots and lots of people in this boat. And that's nice, because if you've got a family, the kids can have cabins of their own. Lovely. And it'll scuttle around the English Channel in high speed. But look at the keel. It's bolted onto the bottom of the boat and it's got a bulb on the bottom. The bulb sticks out in front of the keel as well as behind it. Lovely, shaped like a torpedo. The only thing is that bulb will catch a fishing net if it comes along. It'll catch a lobster pot. It'll catch anything. And um, I've had a nasty night in one of these boats trailing around the English Channel with a load of fishing boys stuck up out the back. Not very good really and we couldn't get rid of them. We had to wait till morning and then back off under sail. We didn't dare use the propeller, but we managed to get it off in the end. So it's not all win-win, as it's always the case with boats. You win some and you lose some. So these boats have a great deal going for them, but be aware of the downside. If you run aground with a boat like this, with any degree of harshness, you've got to lift it straight out of the water and see what's happened to the keel. This one, get it off, sail on, doesn't really matter. If you're not making water, you've got no problem. With this one, you can't be sure. So, there you are. Three different types of boat, three different answers to the same question. Get on the water, find the boat you love, and have a load of fun.